In this short video, we're going to talk about loca extrema and the second derivative test for functions of several variables. Now, the, the material here is very similar to material which we learned in Calculus 1. So I'm going to go back and forth between the review of some concepts from Calculus 1 and some of the corresponding concepts in uh, our Calculus 3 class. All right, so some review from Calc 1. We had the notion of extremum, and that's just a, a short word to say either local maximum or local minimum when we say a local or relative extremum. And again, just for review, if you have a function of one variable, we say it's a local max provided that, well, that function value is greater than or equal to all of the function values around it, right? So at this point right here, this is the sine function. So this would be pi over two. So sine of pi over two is a local max. If I go a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, I'll have to go downhill. And near in this case, when we say near x, or x is near a, that just means that there's a tiny open interval uh, containing a, and all of the x's in, those, in that open interval have this property. And then for the local minimum, it's the same kind of idea. So here we actually have two local minimums on our graph. Now, note that because you have to have this open interval, which contains a, meaning that there has to be a little bit of space to the left of a and to the right of a, you can't have it at the end point of a closed interval because there will be no space either on the left or the right if you're at one of the endpoints. Now, for functions of two variables, what would that mean? Well, something very similar. We say that the uh, z value, f of a comma b, is a local maximum of a function of two variables, provided that, well, that z value is bigger than, or at least as big as all of the function values are. So again, here I may have a local maximum at the peak of one of these hills. And near in this case means in, in an open disk centered at A, so or A comma B. So you would just draw a circle, leave off the boundary. That's what open would mean. So this is just saying that there's got to be a little bit of space in every direction where uh, these, this function value is larger than all of the other function values. And we'd have a similar definition for a local minimum. So in this valley right here, uh, there's, it's actually more like a bowl at the very bottom of that bowl is a local minimum. All right, so that was relative max and min. Absolute max and min uh, is an absolute extrema. Um, for a function of one variable, then that means that uh, the function value is at least as big as all other function values in the entire domain of the function. So for our sine function, we actually know that the largest value uh, output value is one. So this value of one is at when x equals pi over two uh, is actually going to be a local minimum, but it's also a global, I mean, local maximum. It's also a global maximum as well. And this function down here uh, at pi, for example, I have a local max, but it's not a global max. And in fact, there is no global maximum for this function because these arrows on the left and the right are telling me that it is going to go up uh, forever and ever. Um, so um, there would be no global maximum. There's a global minimum down here. 
can't quite tell what value that is, but at this these points here, I have a global min or an absolute minimum. All right, then for functions of two variables, very similar idea. If the function value is at least as big as all of the function values for the points in the domain of f, then it is the absolute maximum or global maximum. And similar idea for a absolute minimum or global minimum. All right, we had critical numbers in Calc 1. Those were x values. They had to be in the domain of the function. And either the derivative there would be 0 or the derivative would not be defined. Those would be critical numbers. And we had Fermat's theorem that says that if we have a local min or a local max, and f prime exists there, then f prime of a has to equal zero. Though we have to be careful because not all critical numbers correspond to local extrema. We had the first derivative test and the second derivative test because while in this nice function here, we have a critical number which corresponds to a local max, another critical number which corresponds to a local min, in this function, which is just a, an x cubed function, um, we have a critical number when x equals 0, but it's neither a local max nor a local min. And here's like a cube root function where we have a critical number when x equals 0 because the derivative is not defined. And in that case, uh, it's a, still a critical number, but does not correspond to a local min or a local max. All right, so functions of two variables. Let me do, break this down one part at a time. All right. And we'll say that a, a point, a comma b, is a critical point of our function of two variables, provided that the gradient is the zero vector at a, b or the gradient at a comma b is not defined. So it's very similar to what we had with a critical number. But instead of having the derivative, we're talking about the vector of partial derivatives, the gradient vector. And when we say the gradient is not defined, that just means that at least one, doesn't have to be both, but at least one of the partial derivatives at a comma b is not defined. And so we have a theorem, which is the extension of Fermat's theorem that says that if we have a local max or a local min at a comma b, and if the gradient exists, then the gradient has to be the zero vector. So this gives us a hint as to where we might look for a local max or a local min, but it doesn't guarantee that just because the gradient equals zero, uh, we're going to have a local max or a local min. It could be neither. And let's look at some examples in a minute. So uh, we use the uh, second derivative test or the first derivative test but in Calc 1, but I'm going to review the second derivative test because we don't have a first derivative test really for functions of two variables. So the second derivative test says that if you have a critical number and the second derivative is positive on the graph there, then you'll have a local min. So here's the case here. Remember, positive second derivative corresponds to concave up. And concave up makes a cup. The second derivative is negative at a, then we'll have a local max. And remember, second derivative being negative means the curve is concave down. And concave down makes a frown. And finally, if the second derivative is zero, then we cannot use the second derivative test to make any conclusion at all. Because here are three graphs, and in each case, the second derivative when x equals zero 
is zero. And in one case, I have a local max. In another case, I have a local min. And in the third case, it's neither a local max nor a local min. All right. And while we're looking at this, let's review. How did, where did this come from? Well, we needed some calc two to be able to answer that. Because remember, we can write the second degree Taylor polynomial and say that the function f of x is approximately f of a plus f prime at a times the quantity x minus a plus f double prime of a over two, or half of that, times x minus a quantity squared. And what we have here is the equation of the tangent line plus a quadratic term over here. So since x minus a is squared, uh, then really the sign of the quadratic term depends on the sign of the second derivative. And so if this is positive, what does that tell me? That tells me that the function value is going to be above the tangent line. It's going to be greater. I'm taking the tangent line and I'm adding some positive number to get my function value. So the tangent line is below the curve, and that would mean that I must have a local min. And on the other hand, if this quadratic term is positive, I mean, sorry, is negative, if this quadratic term is negative, then that tells me that the uh, tangent plane is above. The values on the tangent plane are going to be greater than the function values. So I said tangent plane, and I meant tangent line. Tangent line is going to be above the curve, and I'll have a local max. All right, let's go back to functions of two variables then. Let's find some critical points for some example functions here. So our first one is just a paraboloid. And we have f of x comma y equals x squared plus 4y squared. Our partial derivatives are just 2x and 8y. We'll set those equal to 0 and solve for x and y. And I only get one point, x equals 0, y equals 0. That's my only critical point. And it happens to correspond to a local min. My second example, or second function in this example, is uh, radical x squared plus y squared. Remember, that is a cone, a circular cone. It's the upper half, uh, and it's centered at the origin. So our partial derivatives, I need to use the chain rule here, but uh, I'll get x over radical x squared plus y squared and y over radical x squared plus y squared. Again, I'll set those equal to 0. And solving, that gives me x equals 0 and y equals 0. Now, at that point, at the origin, x equals 0, y equals 0, the gradient's not defined. Neither partial derivative is defined. I would be dividing by 0 when x equals 0 and y equals 0. And in fact, from our graph here, it also makes sense based on our Calc 1 knowledge. In Calc 1, we said if we had any sharp corners that the uh, uh, the derivative would not be defined. And here I have this sharp vertex. So there's no surprise that the derivative or the gradient is not defined at the vertex of the cone. Uh, but since 0, 0 is in the domain, uh, 0, 0 is a critical point. And it happens to be another local min. Now our last example is f of xy equals x squared minus y squared. That is a uh, parabolic hyperboloid, and uh, its derivative, I'm sorry, its partial derivatives uh, are just 2x and minus 2y. We'll set those equal to 0 and solve for x and y. And again, I get x equals 0 and y equals 0. And again, 0, 0 is the only critical point. But in this case, 
0 comma 0 is neither a local max nor a local min. If I just look at it in one plane, it looks like it's a local min, but in the other plane, it looks like it's a local max. So it's actually a saddle point. So we have three cases where we have 0 comma 0 is the only critical point. And uh, in uh, two cases, it was a local min, and in a third case, it was a saddle point. And we were able to make those conclusions only because we knew what the graph of each uh, function was. So we knew uh, what the surface represented by the function looked like. And from that information, we could decide whether it was a local min, a local max, or a saddle point. But we'd like to have a test to determine, let me correct this because it's not a critical number, it's a critical point. We need a test to determine if a critical point corresponds to a local max, a local min, or neither. And so let's go ahead and fix this. I always want to be a critical point. All right, so how are we going to go about this? Well, in our review from Calc 1, we said that um, at a local uh, max, the tangent line was above the curve of the function. And for functions of two variables, the tangent plane is above the surface when you have a local max. And if you have a local min, the tangent plane lies below the surface. So we have something very similar to what's happening in the single variable case. And then if I have a saddle point, then the tangent plane there, uh, I'm not really even sure if we have a tangent plane there. But what you could think about is this, uh, the plane that passes through the origin there, it's neither above nor below. In fact, there's no way you could come up with any plane that would lie entirely above or entirely below and crosses through uh, a saddle point there. Well, now to make sense of this, uh, we're going to have to do a little bit of advanced uh, mathematics here. And you may not understand all of this, but I'd like to at least plant a seed uh, for when you take some additional math or physics or engineering classes, this start might, might start to make more sense. So just like we have a Taylor polynomial for functions of single variables. We have Taylor polynomials for functions of two variables. And the second order Taylor polynomial can be written out in this long form here. So it is, well, you're going to start with the constant term here, which is just the function value at a comma b. And then you're going to look at some first order terms, so the first order derivative, partial derivatives. These are linear terms. And so we take the partial with respect to x and multiply it times x minus a. The partial with respect to y, multiply that times y minus b. And then we get the quadratic terms. And I'll start with 1 half. So that's, that shouldn't be a surprise. We started with 1 half in the single variable case. And we have the repeated second derivative with respect to x times x minus a squared. Then we have our mixed partials, and they're going to be multiplied by x minus a and y minus b. I just changed the order here, but it's all multiplication. And from Clairaut's theorem, we expect that those terms will actually be the same number. 
And then finally, we have the second repeated partial derivative with respect to y multiplied by y minus b squared. So this is really a lot to deal with. Uh, so we'd like to be able to summarize that. And we can, we'll have to use a little bit different notation, some vector and matrix notation. So we can rewrite the first order terms as a dot product of the gradient vector dotted with x minus a comma y minus b. And then we can write the second order or the quadratic terms as a dot product of, well, we have the factor of one half, x minus a comma y minus b. So the same vector is going to be dotted with the product of the vector x minus a y minus b times this matrix H. And what is the matrix H? The matrix H is the matrix of second partial derivatives. It's called the Hessian matrix. So let's take a look at this second order Taylor polynomial a little bit more carefully. Again, we've written it as well, the function value plus the gradient dotted with this vector plus half of this vector dotted with the Hessian matrix times that vector. Well, this part here that has the first up to the first order terms, that is our equation, the tangent plane. And then we have over here our quadratic term. Now, without going into the mathematics behind it, I'm just going to tell you as a fact that this quadratic term will be positive. It's guaranteed to be positive when the determinant of the Hessian matrix is positive and the repeated second derivative, second partial derivative with respect to x is positive as well. So there's two things we have to check. We have to check the value of the determinant of that H matrix and then check the sign on the f sub x, x term. And in that case, we're going to get a local min. And that should make sense, right? Because what does that say? That would say that the function values are above the tangent plane, or the tangent plane lies below the function, or lies below the surface. And in that case, we would have a local min. On the other hand, I'm just telling you as a fact that when the determinant is positive, but the second partial derivative with respect to x is negative, then the tangent plane will be above the surface. So this quadratic term is guaranteed to be negative when these two conditions occur. Which would mean that the tangent plane is actually above the surface and that would correspond to a local max. So now we have a test based on the determinant of this H matrix and the sign on the F sub X X term to, to test if we have a local max or a local min or neither. And that's our second derivative test for functions of two variables. We're going to let d be the determinant of that h matrix. And note that we don't have to always remember what the h matrix looks like. We, if we want to, we can just remember that the determinant is the product of the repeated partials minus the product of the mixed partials, but since the mixed partials should be equal to each other by Clairaut's theorem, we could just take one of them and square it. So if we have a critical point and we have these two conditions, that the determinant of the Hessian matrix is positive and the second repeated partial with respect to x is positive, then we have the local min. 
On the other hand, we have D positive. And the second repeated partial with respect to X is negative. Then we're going to have a local max. And then if we have D being negative, then there, we're done. There's no further test that's needed. If D is negative, then we've got a saddle point. And just like in the single variable case, if the determinant is zero, then we can't make any conclusion. It may be a local max. It may be a local min. It may be a saddle point. We're going to have to do something else to determine it. Well, I'm going to do some examples in a separate video. I just wanted to present the second derivative test for functions of two variables and also show where it comes from and how it compares to our second derivative test from calculus one.